applied in architectural concepts for presentation server. Now, I know in the previous nugget, we talked about how this training is not intended to be a death by PowerPoint. But in order to give you some idea about the, the architecture surrounding Citrix Presentation Server and all the components of Presentation Server, we kind of have to go through a, a series of whiteboards to, to talk about what the components are and how they interrelate and what, what, what each of the components do. And that's what we're going to be doing inside of this nugget. We're going to talk about each of the Citrix components in turn and how they interrelate with each other. And we're going to do this by comparing them. This versus this versus this. And we're going to talk about those in comparison with each other. We're going to talk about the clients, each of the different types of clients that can be used to connect to the presentation server, and also the services. Citrix installs a lot of services inside of your services list. And we're going to talk about all those services and what they are. We'll talk about the network architectures and how you actually can set up Citrix presentation server, both in a LAN environment, in a LAN environment with web interface, and also in a WAN environment that is connected to the internet, and why you would want to do each of those different kinds of architectures. We'll talk specifically about the ICA protocol and, and what the benefits that you get out of the ICA protocol and why you would want to set up Citrix in certain ways to get those benefits associated with ICA. And then lastly, we'll talk really quickly about the other Citrix products out there, you know, the, uh, the, the WAN scaler, the net scaler, the, uh, the access gateway. Not necessarily necessary for the test, but just to give you some idea of what else, what other types of products Citrix provides. So first, let's talk a little bit about the components of Citrix and how they interrelate with each other. I brought up here, you can see a lot of verses. This is versus that versus that on the screen. And really, it's, an, it, it's a way to help you compare and contrast the different components with each other. The very first thing we want to talk about is the concept of Citrix versus Metaframe versus Presentation Server. And really, throughout the entire course of this, these nuggets, the, the term Citrix and Metaframe and Presentation Server are really kind of um, interrelated. Metaframe is the old version, or the old uh, way of referring to Presentation Server, and the name was changed by the marketing people uh, uh, back uh, during the 3.0 days to, to move from a Metaframe, the, the idea of Metaframe as the product, to Presentation Server as the product. A lot of people still refer to Presentation Server as just Citrix, but Citrix is the company that provides the Presentation Server product. So a lot of times your users will refer to Citrix when they actually mean Presentation Server. Throughout the course of these nuggets, I'm probably going to be referring to Presentation Server and Metaframe interchangeably. So really, they're the same thing. There are three different types of Presentation Server that you can install. That's the Standard Edition versus the Enterprise Edition versus the Advanced Edition. And in the, in the, in the nugget where we talk about installing Presentation Server, we'll talk specifically about those. But the different editions that you would purchase for your environment will depend on what your needs are. The Standard Edition Presentation Server is really if you have a single server. If you have more than one server, you'll need some sort of load balancing between those servers, and that's when you would upgrade to the Advanced Edition, because the Advanced Edition adds the load manager components. If you have a large environment where you've had lots of servers and you need the, to be able to push packages to those servers and you need to be able to you manage the resources on those servers and also manage uh, SNMP on those servers, then you would bump to the Enterprise Edition. The Enterprise Edition is specific for those very large environments because it adds Installation Manager, it adds Resource Manager, it adds Network Manager, and it also adds the WMI providers. Those are the different versions of Citrix. And you're going to pay a different price depending on which version you would actually choose. You'll see down here we have installation manager, resource manager, load manager, and network manager. We'll talk a lot about these tools later on, but very generically, installation manager is the tool that is used to help deploy packaged, packaged installations to Citrix presentation servers. Resource Manager is used to monitor the resources, not only the event log, but also the performance of each Citrix server. Load Manager, as we talked about before, is used to help manage the load. So as users are coming into your presentation server, which server should they go to based on load characteristics? And Network Manager is used to connect presentation server to like an HP OpenView or, or, a, or a network management tool. The concept of a farm versus a server is really important too because a number of servers, a number of Citrix presentation servers get collected into a farm. It's the boundary of management. All management happens at the farm layer and then to each individual server. So you'll actually take your servers and based on the needs for administering them and also the network characteristics, are they separated geographically? Are there very large latent WAN lines between them? You will move them into different farms based off of those characteristics. Again, number one, boundary of management. Number two, geographic distribution. 
When we actually go to install our presentation server, we have to install a license server component as well. And this license server is a FlexLM based sort of Citrix rebranded license server that is used to manage the concurrent user count connected to our Citrix presentation servers. Back in the old MetaFrame days, we had server licenses and option pack licenses for the different add-on components for, for adding into our Citrix farm. But now inside of presentation server in 4.0, licenses are simply based on concurrent user count. And this license server is installed either on a presentation server or, or on another web server somewhere near our farm, and it manages the concurrent user count and ma makes sure that we are not over our number of licenses. This license server also has a handy web interface that we can use to view our licenses and see what our license count is over a period of time. The next topic here is the, the idea of data collectors versus the data store versus the local host cache. This is this LHC here, and these are used to manage data that is configuration data for our presentation server farm. The difference between the data collector versus the data store is the type of data that these two components are actually collecting for us and, and storing for us. The data store itself is used for static data, like uh, published application information, like farm configuration. Those sorts of things that don't change that often are kept inside of the data store. The data store is the actual database that you configure whenever you create your first Citrix presentation server and the, the associated farm for it. The data collector itself is used to communicate dynamic information. This is like logon information, published or, or application information, application use information, the stuff that changes a lot over time. The data collector is actually one of our presentation servers. It's not a database so much, but as an, a, a process on one of our presentation servers that handles the collection for that data for a particular zone. Now, I have down here the, the word zone mentioned. Zones are actually collections of presentation servers, usually geographically based or subnet based, and one server is elected to be the do zone data collector, and it manages the collection of this dynamic data for that particular zone. We're going to talk a lot about zones in a later nugget, but just understand that there is difference between the data store, the database itself, and the data collector process. This local host cache is used to manage the, the, the persistent information should any presentation server lose its connection to its data store. So there's the concept of a local database where if that presentation server loses connection to its SQL database or its Oracle database where the data store information is kept, information will also be kept local so the presentation server still has the ability to operate when that database is down. Lastly, down here at the bottom, we have the idea of published applications versus published desktops versus published content. And these are the three different types of information that you can publish to your users. You can publish applications, which is a windowed application, so it, the application looks as if it's being launched on the client device itself. And this is subtly different than publishing a desktop, which is the full desktop with the start menu at the bottom and all the icons and the desktop and everything, versus publishing content, which is a linkage to actual content data. The difference between publishing a content and publishing an application is that you may publish Microsoft Excel for someone to use for using Excel for creating a spreadsheet, or you may want to publish a particular Excel spreadsheet. In that case, if you're publishing the spreadsheet itself, then you'll be publishing it as content. So be aware of this, and we're going to talk about the differences between published applications and published desktops and published content later on in a future nugget, but these are specifically from a high level what the differences are between these three. Now I know we've gone through these really fast, but in later nuggets we're going to talk very detailed about each of these components, but this is from a high level what each of these components are. In terms of Citrix clients, there are actually four different clients that can be used to connect a user into a Citrix infrastructure. We have the Program Neighborhood Client, the Program Neighborhood Agent Client, the Web Client, and the Java Client, or the, the Zero Install Client. Depending on your installation, depending on how you want your users to connect into your Citrix infrastructure, you're going to choose one of these particular types of clients. We have a whole nugget that will talk about what each of these clients are and why you would use each one. The Program Neighborhood Client actually gives your users a lot of configuration control for connecting connecting their client to the Citrix infrastructure. So if you have users that need to be able to create their own connections, you'll want to deploy the program neighborhood to them. If you want to provide shortcuts on the desktop and shortcuts into the start menu for your users, you may want to also deploy the program neighborhood agent or instead deploy the program neighborhood agent. This actually allows the, the centralized control of program neighborhoods so that inside of the start menu, people will, your, your users will have the ability to choose the icon they want. 
The web client is a very, very small client that is only used whenever you're connecting into a web interface. The reason why you'd want to install web client is because, let's say you don't want to provide any configuration control whatsoever to your users. In that case, you can provide this web client and allow all the configuration control to you as the administrator. If you want even less control, you can provide this Java client. Now, the benefit of the Java client is that the Java client has the ability to not need to be installed on a particular client. Now, if you have users that may not necessarily have the ability to do an installation, or if they're running Macintosh or some kind of wacky operating system, not that I'm saying Macintosh is a wacky operating system, but if they're, if they're not on a standard Windows operating system, this Java client is very easy because it simply runs as a Java applet. And if that particular client has a JRE, a Java runtime environment installed, the client's going to work just fine. So those are the available Citrix clients. And again, we're going to talk in a lot of detail about each of these clients in a future nugget, but from a very high level perspective, those are what the clients are and what they do. Moving on to the Citrix services, you'll notice as you install your Citrix infrastructure that Citrix installs a lot of services inside of the services menu. These are all of the services that would be installed if you installed all the components of Presentation Server, including Web Interface, Installation Manager, and Secure Gateway, and all that stuff. But, but specifically, what do these services do? And I, we bring these up here because there are a lot of services here that don't necessarily say that they're Citrix. You'll see here that a few of these have the word Citrix in front of them, but some of them may not necessarily have the word Citrix in front of them, so it can get kind of complicated to identify what are those Citrix servers. Let's go through them one by one. The ADF installer service is used by the installation manager to actually install packages onto a Citrix server. So you'll use the ADF installer as the process which manages that installation. These two here, the Citrix CPU utilization management services, are used in Enterprise Edition for managing CPU utilization. This is for, for managing the resources and also for synchronizing the, the user ID of a particular process with the uh, user ID of a particular session owner for that process. For Citrix licensing, there are a number of different services that actually handle Citrix licensing. This Citrix licensing, w, Citrix licensing WMI service handles monitoring WMI associated with licensing. There's also down here, there's a Citrix licensing service down here, and this is the licensing service itself, which handles the actual distribution of the licensing. You'll also see that there's this license management console for Citrix licensing service. And this is the, the web console itself for managing your licenses. So you'll see that there's actually three different services that are that are used for handling licensing. Citrix has a print manager service, which is kind of a follow-on to the actual print spooler service. And the Citrix print manager service actually supports this advanced universal printing architecture. And the idea behind this is it, it handles the universal driver for printing. It also handles managing the um, mapping of client drives into the, into, uh, into the session. So Citrix print manager service is very important for handling the print subsystem of Citrix. The SMA service is the suite monitoring and alerting service. And this tool actually monitors the event log and also WMI for problems and raises those problems inside the Access Suite console. We'll, we'll see later on what the Access Suite console is and, and how we can look for those problems inside of the ASC. Citrix Virtual Memory Optimization Services actually handles rebasing DLLs and, and freeing up excess memory on, inside the server. This is a tool that comes with the Enterprise Edition of Citrix. The WMI service is used to provide actually the Citrix WMI classes to the system itself. When you install Citrix, you get some additional WMI classes that you can use to query off of. And this is the service that actually is used to manage those classes. The XTE service is used to handle SSL relay functions and also session reliability. If the XTE service is not functioning, those particular functions will not work. The client network actually is used to, in, to manage the client devices, like uh, um, client drive mappings and client peripherals inside of ICA sessions. So this service has to be available for the ICA stream to manage those devices. This diagnostic facility comm server is used to manage CDF tracing, which is a, a tracing facility for, for finding problems whenever you're having problems inside of your presentation server. Typically, this is used by Citrix technical support when they're trying to figure out what's wrong with your particular server. Encryption service handles ICA session encryption. If you're trying to encrypt that uh, ICA tunnel between client and server, this service actually handles the encryption of the ICA session itself. The IMA service, or the Independent Management Architecture service, is actually what handles the connection between the Citrix presentation server and the Citrix management console. This is the, the independent management architecture, which means it's a separate management architecture from the Windows management architecture. You'll actually need this to be functioning if you want to be able to manage your servers across 
different for, across different servers throughout your farm. It links with the MetaFrame comm server to provide comm services so that individual servers can, can be remoted from the Citrix management console. Resource Manager mail service is used by Resource Manager to send email alerts whenever problems occur, whenever alerts get triggered inside of Resource Manager. And lastly, this secure gateway handles the secure gateway functions if you have secure gateway installed on that particular Citrix server. Now again, not all of these servers may necessarily be installed on your presentation server if you don't have that component installed. But you will notice that a lot of these servers do, services do get installed at installation time. So we've talked about the services. And in our list of things we want to discuss today, we've, we've gone over components and clients and services so far. We want to talk next about these network architectures, the different ways that you can set up Presentation Server to, to, to securely connect you with your users. And also we want to talk about the ICA protocol, which is the protocol that connects the client to the server. First thing I want to bring up here is this very, very bad triangle that we talked about in the last nugget. This is this domain that we've created, this nuggetlab.com domain, and we've got a, a domain controller here and a, and a Citrix server here, and later on we'll have a second Citrix server. And then we also have this client. Your Citrix servers do not necessarily have to be within the same domain as your clients, and that's one of the benefits of Citrix. Your clients can be out in the world somewhere, off on a work group, or in a completely separate domain, and when the users come in and connect into your Citrix infrastructure, they can type in their domain information for the particular domain that that Citrix server is in. So you don't necessarily have to worry about clients being in the same domain, but the users that are going to be using these Citrix servers will have to have domain accounts to log in. Now, there's a number of different ways that you can actually set up Citrix services. For example, here's this client here, and this client is pointing in to these three Citrix servers that are in a Citrix farm. This little dotted line here is in, to indicate a Citrix farm itself. This is an example of a LAN configuration. In this LAN configuration, this client goes over a high-speed network to the Citrix farm, and any particular Citrix server is, is sent back to the client. The connection is initiated back with the client, depending on which one is least loaded. So in a LAN environment, it's actually a pretty simple configuration because your clients only need to know where the Citrix servers are, and then they can begin the configuration. As we move into more complex environments, we can add in web interface, for example. And this next screen shows, OK, let's say we take the client and we put a web interface server between our client and our Citrix farm. In this case, the web interface server will provide a, an easy interface so that the users get a comfortable interface where they can choose what applications they want to see. Now, we'll talk about web interface in a later nugget specifically, but if you don't want to have your clients or force your clients to have to con configure the connection between the client and the Citrix server itself, you can configure this web interface so the users only need to know they need to go to a web page and then type in their username and password, and then that web page will communicate with the Citrix farm to enumerate applications. That's actually a lot easier configuration for users if you don't want them to have full configuration control. In those cases, the web client may be more useful to you because you don't want to provide configuration control. But what if this Citrix farm is sitting inside of a LAN infrastructure and the client is sitting outside of that LAN infrastructure? Maybe he's in a hotel somewhere, maybe he's at home, or you want to provide internet access to your Citrix farm. In those cases, we have some firewalls that have to be put up. And the, we have these, these double lines here that are to indicate firewalls. In that case, the client's going to be going up over the internet and connect through a firewall to a web interface server. And that web interface server then connects to the Citrix farm itself. In this case, the Citrix farm itself is going to communicate through the firewalls to the, to the client on the, uh, the outside. Note here, though, that web interface alone is probably not going to be secure enough if you're trying to connect clients over the internet, because web interface doesn't provide security controls to manage the security information, the, the securing the information coming out of these Citrix servers and getting to the client. In those cases, you may want to actually put in what's called secure gateway. Secure Gateway is the tool that actually handles securing the communication between the client and the internet. And there are a lot of different ways you can set it up, but one way you can set it up is to have the client come in over the internet and connect to a web interface server. That web interface server will handle the logon, will pass the information over to the Secure Gateway, and the Secure Gateway will manage the connection to the Citrix farm. And then the Secure Gateway will then proxy all of the communication back to the client. So the web interface is used merely to assist the client with connecting to the Citrix farm, 
And then the secure gateway is sort of a proxy configuration that proxies the ICA traffic from the Citrix servers back to the client. This is a more secure configuration when you need to secure your data coming out of your Citrix servers and getting it to the client. Again, web interface and secure gateway work together inside of this first level DMZ here, and that DMZ communicates over very secured ports to your internal Citrix farm. In a later nugget, we're actually going to talk about Secure Gateway and how you actually configure this communication path between the client and the internet and web interface and Secure Gateway. But from a, from a boxes on paper standpoint, these are the where the arrows go in order to configure and communicate the client with the Citrix farm itself. Now all of this communication happens using ICA. And ICA protocol is a, it's, it's really a, a, a beautiful protocol. Without the ICA protocol communicating between clients and workstations, this, this idea of screen updates and mouse keyboard clicks would not be possible. ICA has been around for a long time and with using ICA you can actually kind of internally divide your applications between those we call fat and those we call thin. ICA is optimized for WAN connections. And what that means then is that we are not necessarily transferring actual data back and forth between the client and the server. We're not necessarily copying lots of files and we're not trying to, to push database updates across that pipe. Instead, we're just pushing the updates to the screen and any mouse and keyboard changes that, that the user may type into their client. This is, a, this is excellent because now we can take and wrap all of those otherwise very fat connections into this very thin connection that is also manageable. You know, it's, it's a kind of a rule of thumb, this 30 to 35 kilobits per second is an average for a, a, a good connection between a client and a server, and that is per concurrent user. So as you add users, you're going to need to add additional kilobits per second to this 30 to 35 rate. So, Knowing this, we can much better plan on the amount of bandwidth that's going to be required to get all the clients that are out in the world into our Citrix presentation server. It's a lot more manageable from a planning standpoint. Anytime that you enable printing or anytime that you enable file transfers so that the, uh, the client can actually transfer a file down to their local hard drive, in those cases that will actually increase the amount of uh, bandwidth that is required to get the client to the server. But for the most part, this 30 to 35 KB per second is good. Now, you can modify the ICA session. You can reduce the color bit depth. You can reduce the ability for sound to pass through the ICA stream. You can eliminate printing to keep this as low as possible. Or if you want to enhance the user's experience, you can enable these settings, but it will there for each user, this rate will actually go up. ICA is very similar to the RDP protocol that is used within terminal services. They've, they've been around uh, for a long, long time now. And really, it, it, in the old days, ICA actually had a lot of benefits to RDP. And nowadays, the protocol itself, the actual, the, the communication path itself is pretty good. RDP and ICA are very similar in the amount of bandwidth that they require. ICA has the ability in, in, in Windows 2003 and, and Citrix Presentation Server 4.0 has a few additional components like feature sets that it can provide, connections to peripherals and USB devices and blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, RDP and ICA are fairly similar to each other. Now, let's talk specifically about the protocol and what this means and why it's useful to us to, to use ICA. And I'm, I want to use an example here of comparing the ICA protocol with server message block, which is the idea of a file share. Now, we've got two clients here, and we've got, this is my really bad uh, drawing here to, to show a network pipe. And we've got this SMB pipe where the client's connecting to a file server, and another client here is connecting to a Citrix server using ICA. In the first example here, you're, you're familiar with SMB. This is the idea where the user attempts to open up a file sitting here on this file server. Let me draw a little picture of a file here. And if the user has to open up this file, what they need to do is make the connection to the file server and potentially transfer that file through the SMB channel, through this SMB tunnel, back to the client. Now, if this file is, you know, two or three or four megabytes large, and this is a very small SMB pipe, maybe they're connecting through a... Uh, an IPsec VPN to get to this file server, that's going to take a long time for this file to actually get through that narrow pipe. 
Over here on the right, using the ICA construct, if the workstation has to connect to a Citrix server and need to open this file, well, the Citrix server is then going to connect to the file server and connect to the file. The only thing that actually has to get passed through the ICA channel is the screen updates, the graphics updates from the Citrix server's graphics subsystem to the client's graphics subsystem. And if the user needs to make a change, maybe they only have a one character change they have to make inside of this very large file. They can open the file, make the one character change, and close the file without having to transfer two to three megabytes across that wire. In this case, this is where Citrix comes in very handy. If this pipe is very, very narrow, if it's very narrow and there's not a lot of data that can get through that pipe, well, in those cases, that's going to be a lot more handy because there's not as much data that actually has to go through the pipe to get from client to server in the ICA tunnel. If we've got a very narrow pipe over here with SMB, well, we still have to transfer that two to three megabyte document across the WAN. So in WAN situations, ICA is generally always going to be a superior solution to file shares because of the way it's ha it handles this data communications. So that's the ICA protocol. And the ICA protocol is used by Citrix to communicate back and forth between clients and servers. There's a lot of other products also that Citrix provides in addition to Presentation Server. And, and these products perform different functions inside of this whole concept of access. Citrix is all about access. And, and this is not necessarily intended to be a sales job for the Citrix products, but this is just to give you some idea of what those products are. These are not necessarily needed for the CCA exam, but these are the other tools that Citrix provides. In addition to Presentation Server, there's a Password Manager tool. This Password Manager tool is a, sort of an SSO tool to help you do single sign-on between applications. The Access Gateway is an upgraded version of the Secure Gateway that's a hardware appliance that is used to, to do the same functions and, and features as Secure Gateway, but in a hardened appliance that's much more difficult to hack. All of these make up the Citrix Access Suite. The Citrix Access Suite is a, a, a way of bundling all these tools with one single license. Edge Site is a new tool that allows the administrator to get more information about what's going on from a performance standpoint inside of your Citrix environments, even all the way down to the client level. So you can help troubleshoot whenever your clients have problems. The application gateway is used with VoIP phones to push applications to VoIP phones. Netscaler and WANScaler are used for network optimization. Netscaler is used for, for website and back-end database optimization across the internet. And WANScaler is used if you have multiple sites that are across a WAN and you need to optimize the communication between those sites. Project Tarpon is a pretty interesting tool that actually does application streaming. So unlike ICA that is deploys the application, just the screen updates and the mouse clicks to the, uh, to the client, Project Tarpon actually deploys the application itself in a, in, a, in a concept called streaming where the application is streamed down to the client. GoToAssist is used whenever you have help desks that need to assist people with, with technical support problems. For example, if you have users that are in hotels and they're having a problem with their laptop, well, they can connect to a GoToAssist session and the help desk can actually assist them by seeing the screen of that laptop sitting in that hotel and solve their problems. GoToMeeting is a meeting tool that is used so multiple people can connect in to collaborate in, inside a single meeting and share screens and, 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 and manipulate data inside of that uh, shared collaboration space. And lastly, go to my PC is a consumer product that is used for consumers that may want to get to a PC from another location. Let's say you're again you're out in a in a hotel somewhere and you need to connect into your home desktop. You can use go to my PC to see the screen and and manipulate your home PC from far away. Again, really for the test, the only thing you really need to know is Presentation Server. There are other exams for the CCEA and CCIA that discuss some of these other tools, but it, it's nice to just be aware of what products Citrix has available and how those products integrate with each other. So we've talked about a lot about just some very high-level architectural concepts associated with Citrix Presentation Server. We've talked about the components of Presentation Server and also the clients that are used to connect the, the, from the client to the presentation server farm and why you would want to use each client. We've talked about the services that may be installed whenever you install Citrix and some of its components and also the network architectures of how you would want to set up your Citrix network. We talked about the ICA protocol, that beautiful protocol that allows us to be elsewhere in the world and connect into our Citrix farm and why it's useful. And then we talked about the other Citrix products that, don't, that aren't presentation server and why we'd want to use those as well. Throughout the rest of this series, we're going to talk a, a lot of detail about these particular components. But this gives you an understanding at a very high level of what the components are and how they interrelate. 
I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.